Great. Good. Okay, okay. We're now streaming live. Good. Hi, uh, hi, Jill. Hello there. <laughs> Great to see you. So I'm just going to get uh, and do all my techie stuff over here because we're in the room. Uh, good. Hi, everybody. Huge welcome to my friend and colleague, Jill, um, who's come to join us tonight. Now, it's a real treat, everybody, because uh, I know you don't do a huge amount of the kind of uh, chatty public stuff like this, Jill, and I think it's really, it's really great that you're coming to have a chat with us in the group tonight, especially on International Dog Day. <laughs> because um, what better way to kind of bear witness to our dogs that we love, right, than um, thinking about how we communicate with them and being able to listen to them. So we've got a lot we're going to cover today, Jill. Um, bear with me a second, let's come over here. So, oh, I could do with some help, really, with these things. Uh, but there you go, there we are. In there. Nice, good. I'm just keeping an eye on there as well. Cool. Oh, we've got those before. Uh, great. Jill, thank you so much for coming in and having a chat with us this evening. Now, uh, we've known each other a little while, actually, and I have to say, you've always been really supportive, and especially when uh, I think it was when I did my kind of thesis for the ICP, so that's going back quite a while now, it's, it's quite a while. I think that's something that you picked up on uh, for sure, but but definitely when I put the Phantom of the Opera piece out, you were definitely somebody that I lent on quite heavily pre-putting that out, and it's interesting, Jill, isn't it? Just uh, how that was quite a few years ago now, but how things have really changed actually, and that narrative which seemed very different just isn't now, actually. There's a lot more people that are kind of Getting on board. Yeah, coming on board. So uh, I just wanted to say thank you, Jill, before we start, really, just, uh, just for your support for me um, professionally and personally. It's been very much appreciated. Well, and I want to say thank you, too, because that article, Phantom article, is required reading for all of my clients. They have to read it before we get started so that they understand that I'm not there to solve a problem. I'm there to help offer relief. And I always ask them, what did you... If you could describe this in one word, it's a long science article. It might be a little intimidating, but if you can just narrow it down to one word, what would it be? And I would say 80% of the people come up with relief. And that's pretty amazing because they, of course, call because they want the five minute solution, fix it now. And they completely turn around when they read the article. So thank you. Well, thank you for that. I just, you know, it's great to, <clears throat> to think that people are being, for me, it's about perception, perception shifts, isn't it? I think it's just so many of the general public, especially, um, they've been so, uh, we'll, we'll unpack some of this today as we chat, but they've been so convinced about kind of obedience and training and dominance and all these kind of things that you, you can't see the wood for the trees then. And uh, by offering a different language, the fact that they really care for their dog gives them a chance to care for their dog right yeah, uh, yeah. and I think that's important and that word relief in my opinion is the most one of the most important words in the psychology of behavior really, when we think about care and support and seeking relief mm -hmm. uh, so yeah what a great day as I say international dog day today um uh let's start off then Jill with hearing a little bit about how Jill got into working with dogs and where and how you built up to this passion about really thinking about we need to be better at learning how dogs communicate and, and how we listen to them. Where did it all start for you? Well, Jane Goodall. So I was nine years old. I found wow. a dog on the street and I wanted to keep it. And my, we had never had a dog and we lived on the water on Long Island in New York. And I tied her to a tree and I st stuffed all the food that we had for every meal in my pockets. And I went out and I fed her and because I knew they wouldn't let me keep her. And then we would take her for walks and, you know, play with her. And I finally did get to keep her, but I got really interested in what Jane got Goodall was doing. And so I would sit in my horse trough while my horse was, while the horse, I didn't have a horse then, but where I was um, staying and I would just sit and watch the horse and I would just watch dogs because that's what she did with the chickens. She wanted to know her parents couldn't find her I don't know if you know this story about her, but her parents couldn't find her. And they finally did find her in the hen house asking her what she was doing. And she was saying she was trying to figure out where the eggs came from and how they did their thing. And I just observed. And so that's what I did. 
And that took me to wanting to just be around horses and dogs at a really young age. And then I became a vet tech and worked for my radiology teacher for a year. And he said, get out of here. No one has been bitten since you've been here. We've had aggressive dogs, fearful dogs, and you've taken them all and no one's been bitten. And I'm always sending some staff to the emergency room. And that hasn't happened in a year. So I didn't know that I, what I knew was a gift, but other people did. And so that's when I started doing this. And I'm really glad I got a good foundation with the vet tech, uh, whole, that whole sciencey thing and thought this, you know, this is great. I'm glad I have it, but it's not where I need to be. No, we can, but we'll come on to this in a, in a little bit, actually, because uh, obviously you're one of those kind of ways of looking at working with dogs and supporting them was very much within a clinical setting. You know, how do we best remove some of the stress, but most importantly, try and get that animal to have a certain amount of input or uh, offer some of the cooperate, co cooperative side of things with their care. But we'll, we'll have a look at that a little bit earlier on. So where do you think that came from then, Jill? So straight out of the box then, you obviously had a, a very connected, a very a, a, a deep sense of connection with animals around you. Is that something that you had in silver really by your parents? Do you think? Can you remember an event that really made you want to kind of connect <laughs> in that way with it with an animal? Or, or well, let's reveal a little bit. Um, yes, um, but not in a positive way. It was more as an isolated child. Um, maybe verbally abused, not feeling heard. And I took to animals. It's like, well, I know that I'm going to get love there. So I stuck with it and got my first horse when I was 13, started riding when I was seven. And I still have two horses I've never been without. And I've never been without a dog since the dog we talked about earlier. So it was by way of more um, a negative association with human contact with parental contact and finding that with animals seeking that out yeah well thanks for sharing that with us by the way and mm -hmm. it's a personal thing to share but but i think also i think there's a lot of people who will resonate <clears throat> myself included in as far as <clears throat> um we all have our different ways of starting to feel that the arbitrary control of another doesn't fit right. And that is often because we felt it ourselves. You know? Right. Um, and, uh, and that must have been something, I guess, when you came to, to dogs specifically, even in that, even as a vet tech in that practice, where culturally, I guess, dogs were still seen, you know, we have to be the boss, they have to do as the told, we need to correct them. Uh, you must have started your advocacy quite early there, Jill. Uh, I, I did. Guess, you know, yeah, I did. And I just, you know, seeing, seeing a dog handled by man handled by three or four people, it just that like, you guys stop, what are you doing? This poor dog, this poor cat, you know, just go away. I'll do this. So yeah, it started at a very young age, even in finding that dog when I was nine. Yeah. Yeah. And in, in the, in the early days of the, the vet, as a vet tech, <clears throat> Did those around you start to join the dots and think, well, maybe our way is why we're getting bitten and having scratch marks on our arms. And maybe there's something in Jill's way that we need to be listening to right now about how she's not getting bitten and ending up in scratch marks. Yeah, well, they absolutely did. I mean, they would always say, uh oh, get Jill. She's got it. She needs to do this one. So, you know, while they saw that there was something that was missing in how they were handling them, um, they gave me the, you know, the animal, the dog or the cat. I'm, I was not that great with birds and I would not touch reptiles. Um, they don't have ears and tails and I couldn't read them. So I was not good with them. Um, but they learned, they absolutely learned from, from watching me work with them. And then I would help people do it. And I've been helping my clients since 1978. So the whole idea of low stress handling and fear free is, you know, it's a fear free is a misnomer as far as I'm concerned. Force free is a misnomer. There's no such thing. We can help to alleviate, but, you know, we've domesticated them as soon as we bring them into our home and put a leash on and we're forcing them to do what we want them to do. So even in that light is even more reason why we need to 
give them choice and give them opportunities to have a voice. Well, that's really interesting. And I think you're right. I think this noma of fear free, it makes it seem that animals who go through that process will not experience any kind of elevation or stress. And I think and I can see why we use these terms, even for three, I, I can see why we've adopted those to really make us a line in the sand against what would have come before. But we have to be careful about what it actually represents. I think most people would agree with that. I think that's, that's right. So what, how did you make that shift then from, so the, the people at the at that clinic obviously recognized your calling, if you like, which wasn't necessarily there to go off and do the stuff. What did you, what did you do next? I went to, and that's an, I haven't thought about this in so long. It's an interesting question. I went and looked for a dog training school and it was an eight week course by some guy. It was very expensive in 1977. And in three weeks, I thought this guy doesn't know what he's doing. And he's, selling this course and teaching people how to do this. I know way more than this guy. So I quit. I didn't even ask for my money back. And I just started advertising in Los Angeles and ended up just developing a really huge business. And I was the only private trainer then. It was all just classes. And then there was another private trainer that came on after me. And then you know who else came at the same time, but we didn't know each other then was Paul Owens. Wow. Oh, great. Yeah, oh, my God. There's a name. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so we were both doing the same thing. And we were both actually, you know, I never used electric, you know, an e-collar or a prong collar. But the only thing that was out was a was a choke chain. And I didn't like that. So I got the nylon ones, you, you know, the nylon choke chains, because I felt like they would be less abusive. But it was a way to keep dogs from getting away because there weren't harnesses then you know, and there, you know, it just was a whole different way of doing things. And I remember reading the Keeler method and thinking that was the only book that was out. And mm. so that didn't feel right to me. So I kind of like had to find my way when I was trying to, you know, learn, I really had to unlearn. So what, what, what year did his book come out? <clears throat> Do you remember? Keeler? Way before. Uh, uh, no. Um, uh... Paul? Oh yeah, I I don't know. But Paul and I are the same age, mm. and so we start. We were training in LA that you know at the same time, but we didn't know each other, and we didn't get to know each other. Or really, we don't. We're not friends. We just know of each other. And mm. you know, when I'm writing an article, I'll I'll you know I, when I need to want to get expert advice, I'll give him a, a call and say, Hey, can you help me? Yeah. You know, I, I need to, I want to quote you. I want to quote somebody that ha, that is an expert. So um, I don't know, to answer your question, when that, mm. when his book came out. Um, so this is really interesting, Jill, because, uh, yeah, we're, we'll kind of jump forward a little bit in, in a moment. But <clears throat> I think for anybody listening, when we think about the, the kind of environment that we work in or we have done for the last maybe 10 years, we kind of take it for granted a lot of the modern stuff that we can tap into and, a lot of the support networks that are there. We've had a big long fight, of course, against dominance and aversives that's gone on and will continue, I'm sure. But here was you back in the kind of late 70s, early 80s, just, just instinctively doing stuff and making a great business out of it. And um, that must have been quite tough though, in some ways, especially when your way might not have been necessarily what people might see as being a kind of a normal approach with dogs, I, I guess, I don't know. Well, I don't, I, it was still, we were still of the ilk that, and, and, you know, of that we, we needed to dominate dogs. So even though I, which, which is why I had to kind of find some balance, right? Um, so there wasn't really a lot, there's way more education today than there was then. It was just, mm -hmm. it's a dog. I don't want to hear it. And I just, you know, let it be here, but I don't want to hear it. Um, which is what most people, you know, felt about their dogs. They loved their dogs, but they, they thought the way to train was to go to obedience school and train their dog to be obedient. And that was something that had to, um, I don't even think I had, I thought of it as a shift then. It's like, yeah, we can teach the dog this and we will, because, you know, the dog needs to be safe, but there's more. There's more. And so 
again, I, I was the really the only one in LA that was doing private in-home sessions. It was all classes. And that was, I had just had my first child in 1978 and, and it was brand new. This whole world of going to people's homes was brand new. So when did you, um, <clears throat> when did you start to shift to having a, that interest in working things out for the other way around? Because of course a lot of dog training is more about getting the dog to understand what we need. Um, uh, then there was a shift. People like Tui Brugas and yourself and others started saying, hang on, we also need to think about what's going on the other end of the lead. When was that shift for you? When did you start to do things in a more kind of structured way regarding learning about the well, I think I, oh, I always <clears throat> did it for myself and my friends. I That was never a shift for me because I, I saw that. But people wanted, and I was young, wanted an obedient dog. So mm -hmm. the shift for me in teaching them something that was that I was already doing with all my friends and all my family and myself probably happened. Um, oh, God, uh, you know, very early on, like it's I started in 78 in the 80s, you know, I had kids. And, you know, there was when you when you be, when you were for me, when you're a young mother, you have to go, well, there's something else happening here. Um, yeah, if I'm going to give them choice, no, you can't do that. And yes, we need to have some boundaries. Um, but how can I let them explore their world? And so I think it became easier for me to have that conversation with other people as a mother. But I was, the shift never needed to happen here. It had, it needed to, ha with me and mine, it needed to happen with how I communicated that to other people. So I th that probably happened in the 80s. So <clears throat> if we kind of come forward a little bit then, and we think about uh, starting to formulate things ahead of the dog decoder project, <clears throat> was that a time when you started to formulate this a little bit more and starting to kind of put things in a more structured way? Did you, did you kind of, you know, in my head, I've just got this image of a kind of a leather bound, a Jill Brightner, book that you sketch and make notes in I don't know does that even exist who knows but, um, yeah but uh, no, you know, to, to try and bring some of these things together and say right you know, I've seen this enough now to, to think that's something um I was actually in the process of doing a video before the the app came out before I decided to do the app and we were half we were like halfway in between I had an incredible cinematographer doing the filming she is the cinematographer for Billie Eilish's movie lots of documentaries that people know she was great we were doing great together and every single day I would just go I read Brenda Aloff's book and I thought this is the hardest thing for anybody to really it was long and it was boring and it was it just it was hard for for me to teach from that or even I had a hard time seeing what she was trying to do um but I was glad it was out there but it was the only thing out there and so I started to do the movie and every day I would go um and search for again you know there wasn't internet when I was started training um and I would search to see if there were people doing what I was doing making a video and Milan came out with a movie. He was coming out with a video about body language. And even though I had a great cinematog cinematographer doing the filming with me, and it was awesome what we were, what we had accomplished so far, I said, I financially do not have the wherewithal to compete with him. Even though whatever he was going to put out wasn't going to be as good as what I was doing. So I gave up on that. But I really, really wanted to do a video because apps were not big then. And one night in the middle of the night, I had this idea, oh, my God, I could make an app. Why don't I just do an app? That's what, nobody's wanting videos. Everybody wants an app. And then I just looked around and I called Lily and said, you know, will you do the drawings for me? And I looked for, you know, no, I was a nobody. Nobody knew who I was. And I asked Sophia Yin if she would, you know, come in and, you know, she didn't know who I was. I said, I'm doing an app. Would you have a, a look at it? And 
tell me what you think and, you know, really scour it. And the, she said she loved it. And the only thing she didn't like was that I used the word submissive instead of appeasement. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, I, I'll change that because I get it. But I actually wanted to use the word submissive because that's what people relate to. And I could start <laughs> the conversation there. But that's I changed always tricky. That's always tricky, I think, when we think about language, because on the one side, we kind of want to meet people where they are. And on the other side, we want to change stuff. And then it's yeah. just giving that kind of change. Yeah. So uh, what I love about the Dog Decoder app, um, and we'll make sure we get some links in for people to have a look at it. And uh, it's, uh, God, you know, I, I, I've lost count of the number of, clients that uh, I've um, invited to, to look at it and then download it is just how user friendly it is. It's fun uh, and especially for kids and they can go through and they can have a look and, uh, and have a look at all these different ways and, and learn about things that's really relevant for their own dog. Right? Mm -hmm. So when it came out, did it kind of tick along a bit or did it go nuts straight away? Uh, well, again, I was a nobody. And so I had to I had to figure out how to get people to know who I was. And um, I got a, uh, an email from Marty Becker asking me if he, and I didn't know who he was, asking me if he could use some of the images because he was had a new project, which at that point, Fear Free hadn't come out. And he wanted to use the two images of the dogs at the vet. One was a shake off and the other one was a yawn for his presentation for Fear Free. And so literally that was like in the first two months. And I said, yeah, sure. You know, with kudos, of course. And um, so that helped, but I really just had to, you know, go out and do it on my own. And, and um, people were very receptive, really receptive. And it helped to have Lily, you know, she had a name. She, people knew about her drawings, even though mm. that was still the beginning and she wasn't that you know, as, as famous as she is now, um, then, um, but it helped because her drawings are amazing and it was wonderful to work with her. I think I would tell her what I wanted. I said exactly every single piece that I wanted. The, I think the biggest piece of this is, do you know, when, when we were little and we went to school, we would learn things to teach our parents, like, my mother didn't know about recycling, right? So you go to school and you learn and the kids come home and they teach the parents what, and so that's why I wanted to do the app and also have, have drawings like Lily's because I wanted to appeal to kids because especially with an app, because they were learning and it was so easy for mm -hmm. them to figure out how to use an iPhone or use an iPad. And um, the person that I had make it you know, designed the app, knew nothing about dogs, which was perfect because I'm a detailed person. And I was giving him all these details and going, Jill, we got to make this like really succinct in order to be in the app. And because he didn't know, he had to keep asking me to questions that I could hone it down. And it was very helpful to have somebody like that doing, creating the, and designing the app. So between Lily and him, I had the knowledge, she had the creativity and did exactly what I asked. And it was, it just came out great. I just, there's so many more images, but we just started with 60 and there's so many more that I want to do, but it's a whole different ball game now. Also, I think it's really easy to forget <clears throat> that um, when we work with our clients, they know very few bits about, they might know or maybe growling's not cool, or, uh, you know, whatever. And, uh, well, so many of my clients who have downloaded the app, used the app, uh, they're just wowed by it. They're wowed by it from a point of view of, um, uh, it, it gives them a window into, wow, there's more to my dog's life here and their attempts mm -hmm. to communicate than I ever thought. Uh, and it shifts them away from this kind of notion of good, dog, bad dog, good behavior, bad behavior. They just start to learn, maybe it's just communication. I think that's mm -hmm. a really powerful mm -hmm. thing about the app. Let's talk about them. Let's talk about uh, 
dog communication more generally than than Jill. Um, what do you think is the area that we need to be looking at more and perhaps we haven't done when we start thinking about how dogs communicate with us? What, what is it that you feel that is the thing that we need to really shift our focus and attention to? Well, everything that you are so aware of and, 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 and trying to educate people on, it's a function of emotion, right? And so they're not, they're talking because that's how their way of telling us how they're feeling. And while many people understand that dog have, dogs have feelings, I find that the, you know, people that have had dogs longer, you know, people that are in their 70s, 80s, they're the ones they, you know, they've had dogs forever and they still don't get it because a dog is not supposed to be behaving this way. So I really do feel like if they understand that what they're trying to tell us is how they're feeling, that's the piece that's missing with new owners and old owners. People have, a dog, have had dogs all their lives. And even with some professionals, dare I say, <clears throat> because I think it's interesting in some areas where you have professionals who learn about body language and then ignore it when it comes to actually just being stuck in that <clears throat> task orientated outlook. Now I talk about the difference between having that task orientation and care orientation. We can get stuck in task very easily. <clears throat> and um, especially, uh, this can be, <clears throat> excuse me, everybody's got a bit of a tickle in my throat. <clears throat> this can be even, um, you know, progressive positive trainers, but especially I see a lot with um, people who are balanced or aversive, they, they kind of recognize the dog might be stressed, but then do nothing to support that. It's an interesting phenomenon, isn't it? Especially when you kind of know that there is some kind of outreach from the other, in this, this case, the animal, but then mm -hmm. choose to overlook that and just get them to do something else that you want them to do. And that's the same for positive as well as kind of those who are more punitive. It's an interesting it's place about that we control. got stuck in. It's about control. And we got stuck in that space for a long time, didn't we? 20, 30 years probably were since we yep. had this yep. notion of training. I, uh, it's about control, but also even when you say um, with the, with the, more positive um, side of the equation with positive trainers, it's it's a it's a level of confidence to approach the owner and say, I know you want this, but it's not going to happen overnight. We need to take this in baby steps because we've been hired, and if we have uh, some kind of a background or went to a dog training school and got a certification and we're being paid for it. We feel like, and I'm going to say the younger generation of dog trainers feel like they are obligated to fix the problem. So they overlook the idea that, yeah, the dog is telling us something, but we got to get this. I got, you know, she's paying me a lot of money and I got to, I got to, you know, get, give her the goods. So they overlook it. Um, and that's a level of confidence that comes with experience. And also, I think up until recently, and literally only the last few years, lack of safe spaces to, to talk about and share and think about how we look at promoting things in a different way and having that mm -hmm. confidence to turn up <clears throat> and advocate for the advocate for the dog straight away and, and shift that perception. The good thing is for anybody who's listening, who's a trainer, who's looking at some of these <clears throat> uh, different things that we're looking at now and finds the shift a little bit daunting, away from just having a very operant toolbox point of view. What I can say is from my, from my experience and every other trainer I've spoken to who shifts, the caregivers really get it actually. If, if you invite them yes. to shift that view, they are fascinated by the process. They get it, they want to support their dog. And actually what the thing that brought us in for, <clears throat> On the surface, it's to kind of come and fix the problem because they're in task, right? And to say, we can feed into that if we're not careful, especially if we come just to do task. But underneath that, what they're really doing is they're reaching out for help. It's the help right, right. they want. And we need to decide, we need to 
uh, show them what that help looks like. You know. Yeah. It, yeah. And and I think if they can, if 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 they can, here's here's what I do is I'll show them. So the, I come for a problem and I show them about how to relate to the dog and how to start something in baby steps that has nothing to do with that problem. And I don't know what that's going to be until I get there. But once I show them that and that, then they have an aha moment and then they have a bunch of questions. I don't spend my time explaining to them in this, in, in that way. I show it to them. I, I might say it once I show it to them. And then what I do and this is so valuable to other trainers is I have so much information that I put in an email as soon as I finish with that session and I'm taking notes on my phone when I'm with them so I can remember what I need to reinforce with graphics from Denise O'Moore from Mighty Dog Graphics with your article with um uh, the theory of uh, the, the dominance theory that Sophia Yin did is 30 minute video, the meditation on tough love. I don't have to spend my time explaining that to somebody. I, I make it in a statement that's old school. It's been debunked. I send them the David Meck thing. I send them uh, Sophia's thing. I send them a bunch of graphics about motivation, about whatever. I have every single graphic that Denise did and other people's graphics and they the email to them when I send it later that day they're blown away because I've reinforced it and I didn't waste my time or theirs explaining all this I remember hearing how do you get people to shift from the dominance theory I don't you don't have to do that do that later show them how it works with a simple whatever that works for each trainer come up with something that that is mind blowing to the owner that has nothing to do with why they called you and then sh do that with the dog. And they kind of go, Whoa, Whoa. You know, like the, one of the first things I do when I'm just going to give an example, a dog, a puppy is jumping and playful biting and, you know, they can't even walk without their feet being, you know, their leg, their pants being torn up. And I get on, I get in and I ignore the dog. So it's not jumping on me the, when I first walk in and then I get on the floor and I let the dog do whatever it wants to me, but I'm shut down. So my eyes are closed. I'm just shut down. My hands are in a fist in my lap and the dog's all over me. And I'm just like this. And then the dog stops within 30 seconds. I didn't do anything. I just shut down. And then I say, have you ever seen this puppy with an older dog? What does the older dog do? And the older dog shuts down, looks away. If it comes over here, it looks away. And it just shuts down. And the puppy says, oh, okay. So those that's my trick. That's my little trick in the toolbox. And then I can go on to saying, okay, do you see what I did here? This has nothing to do with how I fixed the problem. It has to do with who I'm being that can either bring the energy up or bring the energy down. And yeah, we want to greet our dogs. You know, I come in the house and I got an 80 pound Roddy and a 10 pound dog. And they're like, I've been, you know, I just went downstairs to get something out of my car and I come back in and they're crazy. <laughs> I don't want to squelch that. Right. I, you know, they're happy to see me. Great. So I just say, get up, they get on the couch. I sit down and I got one on either side of me and we're good, you know, but they're not biting me and crazy and go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I think that's just a good, powerful representation of that. I think uh, one of the things we learn when we actually shift our focus onto things is actually the power of doing less, the power of doing nothing actually mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh and i think that's that's a scary thing sometimes you know just to, to think i'm just not gonna do much now what i find is <clears throat> when you um one of the things we we have to i think provide more education for is is two things one is how to do really good observations and secondly how to communicate those because this is you know my <clears throat> big mentor is sarah fisher of course not sarah uh and, I, and i've learned uh, a lot from her, from sarah over the years about good observations. And I find as soon as I see that dog, just by doing a running commentary on some observations, like I say it blows people's minds. Yes. Never underestimate the little things that we might know that the general public probably don't. Right, right. And actually, um, 
Sarah Fisher talks about putting a little question mark there when you see something, put a question mark there. So you might say, oh, isn't it interesting how Rove has done that? Question mark. Hang on, Rove's done it again. Same context, right? Question mark. Right, third time now. This could be a thing for this dog, you know? Yeah. And it's yeah. important. <clears throat> uh, so when you think about uh, different <clears throat> ways that dogs communicate, what is something that you feel is often overlooked, even by professionals? Uh, regarding a dog's ability to try and, or attempts to try and communicate something. Well, I'll, I'll 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 do some things and see if you recognize it. So that's the, the kind of lips and the the look aways and the eyes, the small stuff, the nuancey stuff. That's really, People really think nice. a lip lick is like, you know, a lip lick can be like this. Mm. right? You don't even have to see the tongue. But I think the most common thing that people misunderstand, the most subtle body language is the look away. And when that's not observed and understood, then the dog has to get bigger in the communication. Yeah. And they, you know, that how they, and every dog is going to do that in a different way. Okay. You didn't understand that. Um, so how, what am I going to do now? I'm going to maybe do a lip lick. Maybe I'll do a yawn. Maybe I'll literally walk away. You know, I heard you call me to come, but I know you're going to put ear medicine in my ears. Don't yell at me. I don't want that. Come here. And the dog looks away and then you yell more and it walks away. And then you go get it. So you just taught the dog that come means you come to me and something bad's going to happen. And this is really interesting, isn't it? Because uh, when we think about some of the traditional focuses, training-wise, uh, especially kind of looking at obedience and the things we put on, the pressures we put on dogs sub-12 months to comply and do what we ask, um, how much that interferes with dogs' attempts to find relief, we talked about relief a little bit earlier, but definitely looking for those exits, those social exits, those mm -hmm. opportunities just to avoid stuff. Um, uh, what happens then, of course, is the dog can't find those exits or can't do the social processing safely. So they flip to other things. And often when they're younger, they're often always likely to be those fun appeasement behaviors, you know, yeah. that kind of silly stuff which mm -hmm. then makes the caregiver, the owner, the guardian, whatever name you want to use that, uh, <clears throat> feel that we've now got a disobedient dog. So, right, um, I gotta so get this dog under pressure, control. Put this dog under control. Um, so even more exit opportunities are taken away. So when we get to that adolescent dog now, it's no wonder that they sometimes might flip to more socially defensive behaviors, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. and it just starts to build up. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's interesting, we, with Molly, <clears throat> People have heard my story about Molly, who, who, but Molly came to us as a young pup, 16 weeks, two homes, big biter when she came. The expectation was on me and my husband to work out where that was coming from for her. It was social pressure. That was the thing for her. Um, but uh, I think it's the same for people who might homeschool, maybe, or, or educate their children a little bit differently. But um, there is a presumption within our family that uh, Molly might turn out to be some kind of nutty feral dog because we weren't putting a lot of functional stuff in early on. But actually, it's the opposite, Jill. You know, we gave her safe. The fact that she wasn't taught much didn't mean she wasn't learning loads. And that was about her freedom of expression, which is kind of what communication is about, isn't it? It's that ability to feel safe to communicate, whatever that communication might be. Well, this brings up what I speak about in my first session with my clients is trust. And when you don't, when you create a safe place, you're building a foundation of trust. And when you have that foundation of trust, anything's possible. And it's not about, you don't even have to teach a dog to be with you. I can't get my dogs to not keep an eye on me. You know, when we, when we're out and about, I, it's like, I wish they were, would go off with somebody and go, you know, they run and play and they do their thing, but they're always, where are you? And so when, when we, if we can create a safe place for them, the connection 
is built on a foundation of trust and education and learning happens 24 seven. So the teaching that we're doing, I agree with you completely, has nothing to do with controlled training sessions. When I see that stuff in, you know, on social media of doing this stuff with dogs, it kind of makes me crazy. Um, it's there's no choice involved. You know, I'll get clients who say, my dog goes crazy every time we go to agility. And like, what does that look like? How does it manifest? And they'll explain, you know, barking and he's great at home, but he go to agility. He doesn't like it. He doesn't like being forced to do agility. Don't do it. So I'll have a video that I see that, you know, see how the dog is and they stop doing agility. The dog is a different dog. So some dogs love it. Some dogs don't like it. But the point is control happens for the sense of safety in my world. Um, and it happens naturally when we allow more choice and freedom rather than having to put it in there. Yeah, I want my dogs to come when I call them, you know, but, you know, when I'm calling, calling them and they're just, Leela will look at me and my two-year-old Roddy will look at me and like, are you serious? And I'll go, yeah, you know, it's okay. You don't have to come right now. And other people would say, well, you have to follow through. Right. But do I, in that moment, does it matter? I want to go upstairs, but she doesn't. It's okay. That's a really important principle, isn't it? Because <clears throat> whether people want to hear it or not, when we ask our dogs of something, it is a request, <clears throat> really, because we can call it a command or a cue or whatever we like, but um, it is a request. It is a request because we've got to wait for some feedback. And that feedback might be they don't do it. Uh, okay. Then you get the whole argument. I see a lot of catastrophizing a lot of this stuff online about, yeah, but what happens if? What happens if? But then we have to think about our responsibility about where we're offering our dogs more freedom. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. There is always that. Um, responsibility again going back to molly we haven't had to teach her to walk on a loose leash why because from a young age we didn't take her to a lot of over arousing places we let her mooch either on a long line or off leash quiet places got her into f finding internal reinforcement if you like from just being able to mooch around and process stuff if i feel any pulling through the lead from her i know she's elevating that's it we haven't had to teach her not to jump up people because when she first came, the jumping up came from social pressure. It's as simple as that. Quite mm -hmm. often we look at the problem that's already been created because the dog hasn't had a chance to be able to move and exit. And then we think, well, we've got to have a training solution for it. But this thing about, um, about making requests, it's really important. And uh, yes, recalls are really important. I, but one thing I would say is, I, this is my view, and I, I get shot down for it sometimes, but it's my view. Uh, I don't think there is anything we can't, we can't, there's no such thing as 100% anything. And I think people get lulled into a false sense of security. We had a situation recently, <clears throat> locally, where uh, a guy has his dog off the lead all the time, which is actually not allowed on the on a highway, uh, you know, on the main road here, but, the, but he did. But the dog was well-trained, right? Perfect recall, everything. Coming home, dog off the lead, Wife comes home early from work, dog sees wife, dog runs away from guy, wouldn't recall, run into the road, got run over. There's oh. always potentially something in the environment. <clears throat> or our dogs are in a different processing state of mind. This could be so many different things there. So I think we just have to kind of, you know, training is important. One of the things that I see as a criticism is that I feel that we shouldn't train dogs. I mean, that's not, I've never said that. Training is important. I prefer the term teaching, really. For me, it's about building a vocabulary. But guess what? My dogs know way more words than I'll ever teach them. <laughs> they're, they're, they'll associate with the words that really are really important to them. Right? Uh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but, um, but yeah, it's just getting that balance, I think. You know, part of the problem with having a very fixed, task-orientated, obedience view is it doesn't give enough time for that feedback. It doesn't give right. an opportunity for that dog to not do something and to tell us why. Right. So there's no communication, really. There's no communication because if we don't allow the process, dogs need to process. They're not robots. And if we allow the process, that means we're it's a two-way communication. Mm. If we don't allow it. It's all about control. 
And therefore you have a dog who is more robotic and less connected. And people think it's the opposite. If my dog is more obedient, I have a better connection with my dog. I think it's the opposite. The less obedient, the more connection because dogs are always seeking connection. And, and when we allow the process of their observe where we are observing how they want to connect then it's just they don't want to be anywhere else yeah they want to be a dog they want to go run and play and find a stick and chase it you know whatever but they're still connected on a way deeper level than obedience could ever provide and this is interesting because when um when i work with my clients when I first meet them I always invite them to share their own experience I think that's really important it's a good place to start and to let them talk in the language they have because that's invariably a vocabulary of dominance correction discipline whatever but almost always when I but we drill it down together what they mean is they want to keep their dogs safe but the issue there is that we have a notion of safety regarding physical control And one thing that's mind blowing is actually to let them, invite them to consider that whilst we might physically feel our dog is safe, that doesn't mean the dog feels safe. Mm. Because if we want our dog to truly feel safe, they need to know they can communicate. They need to know that we can observe their care and support needs. Then Mm. the dog feels safe. So they're less likely to have situations that are overwhelming for them and, and all yeah. the kind of different things. So it's an interesting shift. And this is the thing that I know is another big passion for you, <clears throat> as well as the body language side of things. It's also then, okay, so we're gonna learn as much as we can. <clears throat> and I think one thing that's worth saying about body language is <clears throat> to allow ourselves to embrace the anecdotal. So we have wonderful um, resources like your, Dog Decoder app, um, we have Turid's book, we have even Brenda's book, you know, it's, it's a quite a hefty tome. I think that's mm-hmm. the problem for the general public. Right. Right. But it's there. <clears throat> These are things that we as humans think, you know, we can make enough assumptions here that this happens a lot. So it might be a doggy thing. But we also have to recognize that the dog we have was an individual, unique, beautiful animal that might just have their quirks and allow ourselves to think, you know what? my dog does this actually, and I'm gonna see that as a thing for my dog. So once we, I just wanna throw that in. So um, so allow ourselves to be uh, able to be, uh, to use the anecdotal from good observations. Don't worry about thinking, well, I've not seen a dog do that before. Think, well, this is what this dog does. Isn't it? Simple. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. When we've learned that, the thing then is it helps us to be a, the, a better advocate for our dog. Uh, mm-hmm. We talked off air before about, how wonderful it is for a client who, for example, in a clinical setting, is able to advocate for their dog and say, actually, no, this is how I need it to be. This is, I need to have that particular time. I need to do it in this certain way because this is what my dog needs and being able to advocate. Okay. One of the big things about good advocacy, though, is allowing our own kind of ego to, to, to move over slightly because it can be very easy uh, for us to project onto another. So I might think, do you know what, I know what's best for Jill. Jill's feeling a bit unhappy at the moment, so I, I know this will make this will make Jill happy if I do this. It's all done with good intention, but guess what? I didn't get feedback from you. I didn't ask you, and that's right. an important part of good advocacy: is thinking, that regardless of what I think is best, it's quite a good idea to get some input from the dog. Well, and getting looking at the world through their eyes, each individual dog's eyes, is the only way that we can be an advocate for them because it has nothing to do with us. Um, I don't know if you no. felt no. about, if you've uh, seen what has gone on with my dog, with the Roddy, do you know what's been happening with her? No. She, um, she ate a foxtail and it caused an infection in her spine and she was paralyzed. And I went to six different ER vets and it, because of COVID and ER, they would never let me go back with her. And she was just becoming two and a ther, you know, in the making to be a therapy dog. And 
every time she came out from the vet, she was worse off emotionally and physically in more pain from being poked and prodded and pulled. No one could figure out what was wrong with her. Why? Because they weren't listening to me and they weren't listening to her. And no mm. one knows their dog better than we do. So I ended up finally going to the UC Davis, which is the vet school here in California after six misdiagnosis and no diagnosis at different ERs and specialty in neurology and orthopedics. And they found out that it's discospondylitis. There was an infection in her spine that was causing her to be in so much pain. So it was six weeks of hell for her. She came out and she now has complete distrust of people. And I brought her back to UC Davis for a follow-up and the tech of the technicians that she knew and treated her for those eight days came and said hi and Leela went after her up on her hind legs 80 well she wasn't 80 pounds because she lost 14 but she was still a big dog and was you know and I and I knew that something was happening so she didn't get her but she scared her so I now have muzzle trained her and she loves it just like her her harness but I have to tell people how to approach her now because she doesn't trust anybody. And I, it, I had to find a vet and a technician to do it the way that I knew that Leela would be okay. So she could trust again, just going to a vet because there's a lot of follow-up care. And I said, I, you know, I can put the muzzle on her. It's not for her. She's not going to bite, but she's really scared. So if it'll make you feel safe, She's comfortable in it. And if you feel safe, you won't be afraid of her because she knows now that you're afraid. And if she thinks you're afraid, she doesn't understand it. She's going to go bark and lunge. Mm -hmm. So that's me being her advocate. And people are afraid to put a muzzle on their dog because of what it makes them think. Leela has never bitten anybody. She's become reactive out of distrust. She doesn't. And when I was working with her and trying to help her during this whole six week of trying to figure out what was wrong with her, she couldn't sit or lie down. She would stand for 30, 40 minutes. So until I could help her sit or lie down. And sometimes she didn't want it. I'd go and say, do you need help? And I'd walk towards her and she would look away. And I would say, okay, she doesn't want help now. Or I'd walk towards her and she didn't look away. So I knew she wanted it. So I started to help her and she'd go, and all she was doing was telling me, I'm going to let you, but this really hurts. I wasn't afraid of her. And I talked to her and I helped her get into a sit and you could hear her go and just, re you know, relax. But if her growl scared me, she wouldn't have understood that. Mm -hmm. I'm just growling to tell you how much pain I'm in and I need your help. Yeah, it, it just makes you think of all these dogs who are desperately being physically defensive of pain, discomfort, you know, or uh, or even in emotional pain. Mm -hmm. And those those kind of um, and especially, you know, again, it's interesting, the psychology where animals who do more of a passive communication either get overlooked or get sympathy or get um, beaten or get beaten and those we do give active communication mm -hmm. are, 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 are more likely to be labeled and demonized and um you know it's, it's interesting i love the term advocate because just going back to the muzzle sorry jill <clears throat> i think uh you know I, I know with my clients who it's amazing how many people are reluctant to put a muzzle on but when you say this is actually for your dog's protection more than anything else, it's to protect them, um, uh, it just changes that view. But this thing about being an advocate, uh, it's great language to use when working with clients, I think, because we need to support them to have that element of supported awareness about their dog's care and support needs. We then need to help them to learn what that looks like from a communication point of view for their dog. Um, then we need to support them to recognize that their role as caregiver, if you like, is to be the advocate. Yes. And people love that word advocate. They're mm -hmm. like, yeah, because for me, if you're holding that leash, 
it's no different to holding the hand of that young vulnerable child or um, you know, uh, holding the hand of a loved one who might be struggling in different contexts. We, we step up a lot, but mm -hmm. we have to be aware of that first, I think. And it's giving yeah. that shift. And that's the power of giving good education to caregivers about what their dog might be communicating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because once they see it, once that genie's out of the bottle, they can't unsee it. I know. <laughs> That's what I tell people all the time. Once you learn this and 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 how to read your dog and understand that they're they're communicating an emotion, you won't. You'll see it everywhere, not just in your own. And it's going to be really hard for you not to want to say something to somebody when you see <clears throat> they're not paying attention to their dog. You can't unsee it once you learn it. And that is a double-edged sword, of course, because it allows us to be much better guardians, caregivers, advocates. But it also means uh, it can be hard to just enjoy a dog walk sometimes because you see it around you. My poor husband, you know, he's he's been on quite a journey since we got together and he's, he's got an amazingly wonderful, empathetic and compassionate thing. That if ever you meet him in person, it just oozes out of him, hence his, his job. Um, <clears throat> but he, um, I gave a talk and actually I think this is how I first really connected to you because I wanted to use some images from the dog decoder. This is going back in the good old days, you know, many years ago, it's like a village hall thing <laughs> with, a, with a projector and a PowerPoint. Oh my God, those are the old days. <clears throat> That's how I was getting But he was really taken by that. Even he was like, wow. <clears throat> and he finds it really difficult when we're out because you just see the dogs who are, trying to say, please, can we slow down? I need to stop right now. This is too much for me right now. Yeah, or the dog starts pulling all of a sudden, you know, and it's not pulling to smell something and it's not pulling to be bad. It's overwhelmed, mm. you know? And so <clears throat> do you have a pulling problem or do you deal with why the dog is pulling? I think pulling is a big one. Uh, actually, it's oh, one it's of my little niggles. <clears throat> well, I think quite often, you know, that's one of the classic pulling is a training issue. <clears throat> we obviously don't want to be dragged down the road, but uh, if you don't address the other stuff, the generalized anxiety, being triggered by the traffic, being triggered by the mm -hmm. social environment, whatever it is, a lot of people, they get stuck because now with the dogs pulling, they're going to do the stuff they learned in the training class because they've learned task at the training class. Right. So they'll right. do the stop and the turnaround, stop and the turnaround. And that dog yeah. must be feeling so overwhelmed right now. Yeah. And the poor caregiver gets stuck themselves then uh, because we don't educate enough about here's some tools to try and help your dog to walk on a loose leash, great. But bear in mind that when they're in an elevated state, it's gonna be extra difficult and trying yeah. to find ways to help them decompress should be your first thing to think about before mm -hmm. getting them back into position. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's, it's funny because it's one, it, you know, loose leash walking is one of the, I think, biggest problems people have with their dogs. They, they are just not comfortable walking with their dogs. They do it but it's not a pleasure for them. I just wrote an article for Dogster about loose leash walking. And I started out with, I never teach dogs to heal. It's not a, even in my vocabulary. I just, th there's no reason to take, and the only reason your dog needs to walk on your side is for that moment in time when you're sharing the sidewalk. Yeah. As soon as you pass that person, <clears throat> the dog should have freedom on the leash again. So, but people don't realize how, you know, what's happening with pulling, that it, it's, it, it is an expression of anxiety on some level and it needs to be addressed. And that's, again, part of advocacy, which is part of seeing the world through their eyes. What's happening? Why all of a sudden is this happening? Why has this been happening all along? Especially for some dogs who are already trying, struggling to process stuff in the environment already, hence the elevation they're experiencing mm -hmm. to then try and focus in on the owner caregiver who's <laughs> trying to do training and stuff but to be fair to the general public you know one of you know when that dog is young one of the first things they get told is you've got to get this dog to walk on a loose leash and they have to walk right. to heal or, especially if right. you have that kind of obedience mindset <clears throat> i worked with a dog recently who some people have heard me share the story before but it's just a really good powerful example of good observations and how it can change a dog really quickly so this dog a uh, spaniel dog uh, would see other uh, dogs and, and lunge and bark. That was the presentation. Um, the caregivers were very obedience minded before they met me. So the dog had to walk to heel to one side. 
uh, on a collar short lead. Okay. Um, when we actually did our observations, so that's in a, one of the facilities that I, that I use, Sans Posh facilities, Jill, it's a field, uh, a field that is private, uh, and we can, we can do some observations. Even when humans entered that space, this dog would do some displacement sniffing, you know, that kind of fake sniffing, like what they kind of do, 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 do sniffing, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> shift to the left, it did it every time. Yeah. When we started to think about introducing some dogs a little bit later on, harness, longer line, guess what the dog would do that? sniffing and go to the left. So by getting the caregivers to shift to a harness and God forbid, allow the dog to walk a little bit ahead of them, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> now the dog had the chance to move in the environment to feel safe. That's all that dog wanted, Jill. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, it just goes to show good observations, giving them a chance to do that. When I meet a dog, I wanna see how that dog processes me, the environment, yeah. how they move in the environment. Movement's a big thing, especially for those exits. Yeah. Uh, it can be something as small as just a little look away, as you say, even just with yeah. the eyeball. Sometimes mm -hmm. there, sometimes it's those shoulders. Yeah. I find a dog who's pointing at a dog, I, I tend to work with dog, dog cases. So when that whole body's looking over, that dog can find it harder. But if they shift slightly, and often they will, if you if they have the chance, they can look over their shoulder a lot easier. They're having a yeah. look now rather than having that whole nervous system. Yeah. So these observations can be really powerful, aren't they? And, and just allowing the dog a bit more ability to do what they need to do to feel safe. It's yes. a fundamental thing, isn't it? Yeah. And, you know, like loose leash walking doesn't mean they have to be on six feet or 50 feet. If I'm working with a dog who's reactive, but I wanna give a sense of freedom and we've moved from an area where we understand where it is. So it's always a familiar turf. We don't put the dog in an, in an environment we know is going to be reactive like you. We observe first what's going on. Mm. I'll just choke up on the leash. So I may be this close to the dog's harness to the clip, but there's no tension on it. So the dog still feels the freedom but I know, and we're at the point where we can do this, but I know that it it wants to go over over a certain, like over that way to, to make sure that it can see that dog because it's afraid. So I'll let it go over there, but I'm still here because that dog might come, it may be off leash, it might be coming close, something's happening. So the tension on the leash is, is important while you're allowing freedom. If there's a situation where the dog can't get close to another dog or a person you can't get away there's no house to no yard to go up to there's no street you know the street's too crowded that you've got to pass this mm. right and, and it's, it's interesting hearing uh somebody like Sindor Sindor Pangal talk about her observations yes. with the streeters and how they use space to avoid elevation and yes. to stay well regulated and to stop conflict and um and i think uh, again when we think of some of the obedience stuff how much we limit exit options yes well you know uh, uh, i lived in france for a couple of years and there's so much more freedom with dogs on the leash and bringing dogs to places they're so much better socialized than they are here in america but third world countries i've been there too and those street dogs they there's you never see a fight unless a female's in heat if somebody's eating food they kind of give it its space and move along and they travel in packs or they travel separately and it's very peaceful there it, it, in our world we would think oh my god those poor dogs but I, th I don't know where I just read this, but somebody found a street dog and and brought it home and realized that it wasn't happy inside and let it out. Did you see this? I don't know where I saw mm -hmm. it and just realized the dog was happier, brought it back to where they found the dog and the dog was happier there than being locked up in this person's home. You and know, that's a big thing, so isn't it? Mm -hmm. we have to get out of our own head about what we think is best for a dog when we listen to them we can do that beautifully put because <clears throat> coercion uh the path to coercion is often laid with good intention you know yeah. it's not always about you must do this or because i'm the boss mm -hmm. often because we presume wrongly that we like i said earlier that we know what's best right 
And actually, I, when you, you you mentioned Jane Goodall right at the top of the hour, we've kind of filled the hour already, which is great. I knew we'd go by, was by that. Um, uh, her great teaching for all of us is to stay humble. Stay humble and observe. And observe. Yes, that's the thing. And I think we don't need to do anything. We just need to observe, and 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 humility. It's just like yeah, that's in life, right? But especially with animals who don't have language, our language. And that's the gift of kind of allowing ourselves to move away from an arbitrary view of training or whatever else, and allow ourselves to connect. Mm -hmm. uh, because it does keep you humble every day because we're learning all the time, right? And what I love about this discussion, Jill, um, the one we're having now, the one I try and curate within Dog Center Care, the wider stuff that's going on, is when we start to shift away from that arbitrariness and start thinking about connection and the emotional experience, as I like to frame it, it's the democratization of that because we all have an emotional experience for start off, so we can all have a point of reference, but actually everybody can connect through. You don't, um, you know, which is actually easier for caregivers, I find, you know, often the more geeky um, uh, kind of uh, skill-based stuff that we can have with dog training, people can find that hard, but actually people can connect through emotions because we all care, right? We're, Sometimes I know, but but the vast majority do. And again, I would invite my colleagues out there who are a bit worried about moving away from something that's quite task oriented because you can leave people with that training task. Mm -hmm. That actually, the vast majority of people would sooner just find ways to care better, yeah. know, to to do their care better because it's easier. Mm -hmm. You don't have to spend hours doing it because you're doing it all the time. It's just that lack of awareness. I think that's the problem. I think sometimes. Well, it, it is a lack of awareness. And I think the awareness is that every interaction we have with our dog is a training session. Mm. So we don't, we don't have to do anything. Like I, you know, we're all they have. They're watching every move we make. To, they know what shoes I'm putting on, where we're going, or if they're going. You know, and I don't have to say a word. If I say, if I put a certain shoe on, I go to the door. They don't even go with me because they know they're not going to go. But I look back at them and I see, I'll be, you know, I'll be back. And my little one, this little one who's right here, when I say I'll be right back, she won't even look at me. She just goes like that. I'm not, you're not, <laughs> me, I'm not going to look at you. You know, so they know. And, and yeah. if we can, if we can tap that knowing and observation and that kind of connection that there's nothing to be done skill wise but much to be done intuitively that is where i think a real the real connection happens that's a really powerful kind of sentiment to kind of finish up on i think um <clears throat> as i've said before you know there is a huge difference people have to remember between what we're taught and what we learn same for our dogs actually and I think um, uh, the one we've got to recognize is we've got to provide more balance. There has to be more recognition that for me, training, teaching, that side of things from us is one side of the coin. Because actually what we're saying to that animal is this is how humans communicate. This is what humans need. Body language and reading dogs and observation should be the other side of that coin because that's the dog's ability to say, okay, this is how dogs like to communicate. And this mm -hmm. is what I need from you. If we get mm -hmm. those two right in balance, it's the most beautiful thing, right? Yeah. I mean, they learn, they learn our language way faster than we learn theirs. Yeah. Well, that's, that's the irony, isn't it? Who's the, who's the kind of intelligent species here? You know, they, had <laughs> a, they had a stuff thousands of years ago, right? I think they worked stuff out. And in fact, they had to really think about that because being safe, is important right. and they have to yeah. learn those safe those safe cues and those safe connections and um uh jill you know we're, we're a bit over the hour but uh it's just been amazing talking to you uh so where can people find out more about your work um i'd make sure we put links in the in the chat here as well well i'm just dogdecoder.com i have a blog there um i write for a couple of dog magazines um whole dog journal dogster um and 
you know, I'm doing Zoom sessions all over the world uh, and close to home. And I started doing Zoom before COVID. So it was Skype then. Uh, it works. I'm right there in the living room. So I can show you with my dogs. I can show you at a park. I can can do it all. And I travel up and down the coast. So training now, uh, living in my little RV, going up and down the coast. Oh. <clears throat> it's been awesome. I stay two weeks at a client's house, spend four hours a day with them doing whatever they need, and they don't have to send their dog away. I spend two hours in the morning, two hours in the afternoon, wherever the needs are. And then I take a break and play and then go to another client. And, you know, that's the power of working this way, isn't it? Because once we've supported that awareness for the client, once they see things differently, they can make their own adaptations and, and it yeah. can happen quite quickly, actually. And I think yeah. that's one way of deflating some of those expectations that are actually getting in the way a lot of the time, the expectation the dog must do this or must do that. Right, right. Once we by this time. That, by this time, yeah. Once we realise that the dog might not be able to do that or is struggling at the moment or needs more mm -hmm help and support it can be a big big change for people yeah 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 uh great well thank you so much jill thank you everybody for tuning in uh, next week we've got <clears throat> well, we've got quite a lot on next week so we've got kathy gregory uh next tuesday evening uh and she'll be explaining this so this fits really well with our narrative today actually jill because uh kathy's kind of created this notion of free will free, free will teaching uh and uh so that fits very much about this thing about how much more the dog will learn through that kind of experimental connected learning than anything we do in a structured way right right um and then we've got uh tracy binder here on uh, thursday uh looking at zoo pharmacognosy and um looking at how that integrates especially with an ace approach uh animal centered education approach and then on saturday we've got the lovely ladies from ICANN, the international Command animal network taryn and ruby um how i'm going to control talk about control how i'm going to kind of uh um, do that chat we'll see I, I think i'll probably get token over there but uh it's going to be a great lot of fun i think that's for sure uh, so uh those are the chats coming up next week thank you again for tonight jill and thank you everybody for for joining in this evening and um yeah see you all thank soon you, andrew thank you thank you thank you for just being who you are and doing what you do Oh, bless you, darling. Well, likewise. Um, and please check out the dogdecoder.com and also the Dog Decoder app if you haven't downloaded it. And if you're a professional, it's such a great resource to get your clients onto because uh, they will, once you start using it, you can't put it down and they're just going to, it'll do all the work for you, right? Um, <laughs> so uh, that's really important. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jill. Lots of love, Thanks. darling. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Okay. Bye.